it's a, it's a beautiful day. And um, once again, welcome to church if you're here in person, or maybe if you're watching on the live stream, we want to thank you so much for uh, just taking the time this morning to come here and to worship the Lord and to um, just uh, spend some time with, with uh, the body of Christ and fellowship. I want to thank you so much for uh, your time this morning. All right, so this morning um, we will be in Revelation chapter 2. And this morning we will be in verses 8 through 11. And the title of the message this morning is The Suffering Church. The Suffering Church. So um, we'll go through this study together and then we'll partake of communion at the end of, um, of the study. So in just a little, a little while here. But here in Revelation chapter 2, um, if you all remember uh, from the last time we were gathered uh, together we talked about the letter that the Lord had written to the church there in, um, in Ephesus. And we learned that there were some wonderful things that were happening there in Ephesus. Uh, there were some great things that were taking place, right? They were doing some really wonderful things um, for the Lord through their labor, through their endurance, um, and their unacceptance of the works of evil people. And specifically, they're speaking of the Nicolaitans, right? We talked a little bit about the Nicolaitans um, the last time I was up here. But despite all those wonderful things that were taking place, uh, the Lord had something against the church there in um, Ephesus. So you see, when you think about the Lord, um, the Lord sees everything, right? He sees our hearts. He sees our minds. He knows our motives. He knows everything behind our service onto him and onto um, the church. And we talked about the fact that this was a very important thing. These are things that we have to resolve before we serve the Lord. You know, why are we serving the Lord? Is it to please the pastor? Is it to please people? Do we have our own personal agendas, right? Those are things that we need to resolve before we actually go and start serving the Lord in some capacity. You see, the church there in Ephesus, they had left their first love. They had left their love for the Lord and they had left their love for, uh, for one another, and in a sense, they were just kind of going through the motions. They were busy for the Lord, but they were not busy with the Lord. And that's something that can happen to any of us in ministry, right? As we serve the Lord, we can be so busy doing things for the Lord. We forget to be busy with the Lord. And then suddenly we're doing all these things in our own uh, power. And then, um, and then we get burned out, right? Ministry starts to become a burden. It starts to become um, something you don't want to do anymore. You start to resent it. And we need to be careful. We need to let the Lord lead um, by his spirit. But the beautiful thing about the church in Ephesus, if you guys remember, was that they didn't lose their first love, right? They had just left their first love. The Lord didn't take their love, his love from them. They had just left their first love. They knew exactly where they could find um, that love. And in fact, the Lord reminded the church there in Ephesus of three things. He told them to remember, right? Remember where they once were in their love for the Lord. He told them to repent, right? To turn from their ways and go back to their former ways when they were with the Lord in, in love with him. And then he told them to return to those first works, the things that they did when they first fell in love um, with the Lord. And as believers, we know that the spiritual life and the spiritual state of individual churches and the church as a whole is determined by the spiritual life and the spiritual state of us, the individuals, right? Our spiritual state, our spiritual life is going to determine the state of the local church, and then that'll determine the state of the church as a whole. We need to be very, very careful. And this morning, as we continue through these um, letters to the seven churches there in Asia, of course, we're not going to read all of them this morning. Um, we're going to focus on the church of Smyrna this morning. Um, this is very applicable to, to not just that church in that time, but to us as well this morning as we live in the current church age now. And the letter today we're, we're going to see is going to have a very different tone than the letter that the church of es Ephesus received from the Lord through John. And in fact, this letter this morning um, is one that is of great encouragement to this church. This was a group of people that were facing some great uh, difficulties. Okay, so this is going to be very encouraging uh, to the church there in, um, in Smyrna. Now, just a little bit of a background. So once again, 
Um, when you think about the letter to the Ephesians that we, we read, or the church there in Ephesus, we read the last time, uh, there was a structure to the letter. Remember that um, there was, I think it was seven or eight different things that we see. Uh, but when you think about Smyrna, what we're going to see first is that the Lord will address the church specifically, which is Smyrna. The Lord will introduce himself, who he is. He will remind them of who he is. And then there's going to be a statement about the condition of the church there in Smyrna. And then there's a verdict from the Lord about the condition of the church as well. And then there is going to, there's going to be a command from the Lord. And then there's an exhortation to all Christians there in Smyrna. And also to us as well as we read the letter this morning. And then finally, there is this promise of a reward. Okay. Now, when you think about Smyrna, the name Smyrna means um, myrrh or it can mean bitterness, okay? And Smyrna was about 30 to 40 miles north of um, Ephesus, which is like the distance from here to Las Cruces, okay? So it was north of Ephesus, and just like Ephesus, it was also a harbor city, okay? One scholar describes Smyrna in this way. He says, this was a large, beautiful, and proud city. It was a center of learning and culture and was proud of its standing, as a city. Smyrna, Smyrna was outstandingly beautiful city. It claimed to be the glory of Asia. Now Smyrna, this church was likely founded during Paul's um, third missionary journey. And you can read more about that if you look, for example, in the book of Acts, uh, specifically in, um, in chapter 19. And this city is actually a functioning city to this day. Um, it's not referred to as Smyrna, but it's better known as Izmir there in Western, um, in Western Turkey. Okay, so you can, you can find that on a map, um, but that is modern day uh, Smyrna, which we're going to be reading about this morning. Now, the unfortunate thing about Smyrna is that there was a large population of Jewish people living there that bitterly opposed Christianity. Okay, and as we read this morning, the Lord will have some encouragement uh, for this body of believers and for us today as we face difficulties. And maybe one of these days, if we face any type of persecution, um, and we can talk more about that as we go through the study. But let me go ahead and open up in prayer, and then we'll read the text together, and then we can look at this um, uh, verse by verse this morning. Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for this time, Lord. We had a beautiful time of worship this morning, and um, I just thank you so much, Lord God, for your love and for your compassions and for your mercies. And um, we, we, we just thank you so much that we could gather this morning as brothers and sisters in the Lord. It's always a blessed time, Lord, when we can come together and to seek your face, Lord. You know, no matter what we're facing this morning, we know that you always have something for us, Lord. And we come here this morning expectantly, desiring to hear from you. I pray, Lord, that you fill me, fill us all, fill this place with the power and the person of your Holy Spirit. Help us, Lord, to have understanding. You know, your word never comes up void, Lord God, and we know that you have something for us. And we just thank you once again for this privilege, for this opportunity. We love you, Lord. We love your word. And we pray that you teach us this morning through your spirit. We love you. We praise you once again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so Revelation um, chapter 2, and we're going to read verse 8, and we'll read all the way through verse 11. So this is the letter to Smyrna. So here John documents for us, and these are the words of the Lord. He says, Write to the angel of the church in Smyrna. Thus says the first and the last, the one who was dead and came to life. I know your affliction and poverty, but you are rich. I know the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Don't be afraid of what you are about to suffer. Look, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison to test you, and you will experience affliction for 10 days. Be faithful to the point of death, and I will give you the crown of life. Let anyone who has ears to hear Listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who conquers will never be harmed by the second death. Amen. So the first thing we see um, in this very short letter 
but so, so much information here to the church here in Smyrna is that the Lord addresses this specific church, but he also describes or identifies himself. So if you look back to verse eight, it says once again, write to the angel of the church in Smyrna. Thus says the first and the last, the one who was dead and came to life. So just as we saw with the letter that was written to the Ephesians, the Lord is addressing the angel of the church here in Smyrna, right? And I think the last time we talked about, well, who is this angel? Well, if you remember in Revelation chapter 1, verse 20, it says, there the mystery of the seven stars you saw in my right hand and of the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches, right? So there in Revelation chapter 1, verse 20, this angel once again could be maybe the pastor of that particular church, a representative for that particular church, or um, perhaps an angel that was keeping an eye on the state of that church there in Smyrna. And as we saw with the church in Ephesus, this letter was not just addressed to that angel, but also to the church um, as a whole. And as I mentioned earlier, not only just relevant to that church, but also to us as we are in this current church age today. But notice that the Lord identifies and it describes himself uh, to the church, right? He says that he is the first and the last, the one who was dead and came um, to life. And it's interesting because when the Lord appears to John, uh, for example, in the first chapter here in Revelation, he describes himself in a very similar way, right? If you look at Revelation chapter 1, verse 8, he says to John, you know, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, the one who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. And then if you look in Revelation chapter 1, verse 17, he says, when I saw him, this is John speaking, speaking of the Lord, I fell at his feet like a dead man. He laid his right hand on me and said, don't be afraid. I am the first and the last. And, you know, this is just a wonderful reminder of the Lord's eternal character. You know, we know, for example, the, he, the author of Hebrews tells us that the Lord is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we know for all eternity, he's going to be the same. So here we see this eternal character um, of the Lord. But then he also says this. He says that he is the one who was dead and, um, and came to life. He also describes himself in this way to John in verse 18 of Revelation chapter 1. So if you look there in Revelation chapter 1, verse 18, he says, um, I was dead. This is the Lord speaking of himself. But look, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. So through this, he reminds the Christians there in Smyrna and even us today, that we serve this risen Lord. We serve the living God. He was victorious over death, right? Death could not hold the Lord. He was victorious over that. And when you think about the resurrection of the Lord, like that is the greatest event in the history of the world, right? That is the biggest thing that will ever occur, has ever occurred on this planet. And in just a few weeks, actually, we're going to be celebrating, we're going to be remembering um, the resurrection of the Lord, right? As we celebrate Resurrection Sunday or, or Easter Sunday, um, whatever you call it. Um, but we are going to celebrate that very soon here. Because when you think about the resurrection of the Lord, a very, very important event. If the Lord hadn't risen from the dead, then our faith would be futile. It would be weak. There would be no effect. And our gathering this morning would just be a gathering, right? There would be no significance to this. But we know that the Lord did rise from the dead. And in fact, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 17, he says, And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. I mean, could you imagine that? You know, we'd be, be like meeting and, and there would be no significance to this. But the fact that Jesus died for our sins, the fact that Jesus was buried, and the fact that Jesus rose from the dead three days later, it gives our faith very, very much power, right? It's a very powerful thing. 
It gives us a hope. It gives us a future. And we have concrete evidence of the resurrection, right? When you think about when the Lord resurrected from the dead, many, many witnesses, they saw the Lord after that. And in fact, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, um, beginning in verse 3, and I'll read through verse 8, uh, he says, For I passed on to you as most important what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. There is the gospel message. And that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, Then he appeared to over 500 brothers and sisters at one time. Most of them are still alive, but some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one born at the wrong time, he also appeared um, to me. So as we can see, there is a significant event, which is the resurrection, right? Like the greatest event in the history of the world. And there is concrete evidence of this resurrection. And certainly being reminded of this gives us a hope. It gives us a future. It encourages us. It puts everything that we're going through in this moment into perspective relative to the eternity that we have in the Lord. And physical death has no sting on us, right, in the Lord. It only transfers us from this world to the presence of the Lord, right? Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8, that to be absent from this body is to be in the presence of the Lord. And um, I don't know about you guys, but that's something I'm really longing for, to be in the presence of the Lord, to see him finally face to face without any barriers. And that's something that we can hold on to and we can hope for because that's a promise that's given to us through his word. And his word is truth. We trust his word. But when you think about Smyrna, um, you know, thinking about the resurrected king and thinking about the fact that they have this hope and they have this future was something that was very encouraging to them. Um, They were facing some very, very difficult things. They were facing persecution. They were facing the the threat of death every single day. And, you know, what's interesting, you think about uh, Smyrna and, you know, like I told you at the beginning, the name Smyrna means bitterness or it can mean myrrh. And when you think about myrrh, that sweet smelling perfume in that time, in those places, it was often used to preserve bodies, to embalm bodies. And when you think about our faith, in a sense, in the Lord, because of the resurrection, the victory we have over death, um, we have preservation too, right? Because he is the propitiation for our sins. So because the sting of sin is death and our sins are forgiven, we have eternal life. And I know it's easier said than done, but that should put everything that we're going through into perspective. And this should be an encouragement to you this morning as it was to the believers there in Smyrna as they were facing some difficulties. And we can say with confidence that when Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior, no matter what happens to us in this life, um, we will spend eternity with him. And that's that's so cool. That's a beautiful thing, a beautiful hope that we want to tell more and more people about, right? Um, Because there's no hope in this world, in the temporary And we know that nothing, absolutely nothing can separate us from the love of God. And that is our, that is what you call the believer's triumph, right? That's what we triumph in every single day. But then notice as we move into verse 9, that the Lord further declares that he knows what these people are going through, but also he, um, he knows, uh, actually he, the Lord knows and thinks What he knows and thinks, I'm sorry, that's what I'm trying to say. What the Lord knows and thinks about the believers there in Smyrna, okay? So that's what what we're going to see in verse verse 9. And I love this because sometimes we don't think the Lord knows what's going on in our minds or in our hearts or even, um, you know, knows what's going on in our lives. But this will maybe put that into perspective for us. But he says here in verse 9, he says, I know your affliction and poverty He says, but you are rich. He says, I know the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. So notice that the Lord, he was well aware of their affliction. He was well aware of their poverty. Um, And when you think about the Lord, he's all knowing. He knows everything, doesn't he? And when I was reading this, it reminded me of Psalm 139. 
And um, I'm sure all of you have read that psalm. It, it's a beautiful psalm. It's a great reminder. And I love in Psalm 139 how the, the psalmist, he declares the, the all-knowing and ever-present God whom we serve. And I'll read a small portion of it here. So if you look at Psalm 139, it says, Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I stand up. You understand my thoughts from far away. You observe my travels and my rest. You are aware of all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know all about it, Lord. You have encircled me. You have placed your hand on me. This wondrous knowledge is beyond me. It is lofty. I am unable to reach it. And I love that because he knows everything about us, everything we're going through, everything we feel, right? Because the Holy Spirit lives inside of us. And when you think about the church there in Smyrna, this was a body of believers that was dealing with some spiritual warfare. And the word of God tells us, and we'll see in just a little bit, there was a local synagogue of Jewish people that were slandering them, okay? And God knew they weren't alone. God was well aware of what was taking place here. And I think sometimes when we go through some difficult times, we think that like God's over there and then like we're over here and like he's oblivious to what's going on in our lives. But the truth is the Lord knows exactly what's going on. And he cares, right? Because he loves us so much. And we're going to see um, what he does for this church in just a little bit here. Don't ever think for a minute that the Lord has forgotten about you because he hasn't. And, and I've gone through many seasons where I'm like, Lord, where are you? Like, have you forgotten about me? But the truth of the matter is he's in all the details. Like he's holding you in his hands. He knows exactly what's going on. And sometimes because we tend to leave the Lord, right? Because we're still in the flesh and we're sheep and we're not very smart. Um, we do those things. But the Lord's not like that. He's not like us. He's different. And if you feel like he's forgotten about you, he hasn't. He's with you. Maybe you've forgotten about him and you need to call, call out to him and go back to him again. Go back to that first love like we talked about a few weeks ago. You see, God never allows us to go through difficulties or temptations um, in our lives that we are not capable of bearing in the Lord, right? He won't allow us to go through things that we are not capable of bearing in him or through him. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 talks about this. I believe it's like in the 13th verse. But notice though that the Lord says a couple of things regarding the persecutors um, of the, the, the individuals here in Smyrna. He says, those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Okay, so there, there he's describing the persecutors. Okay, and what does he mean when he says those who say they are Jews and are not? Well, I was kind of pondering this and kind of studying this a little bit. I think what he's referring to is what the Apostle Paul tells us in the book of Romans. If you look in Romans chapter 2, beginning in verse 28, uh, Paul says, For a person is not a Jew who is one outwardly. And true circumcision is not something visible in the flesh. On the contrary, a person is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is of the heart. By the Spirit, not the letter. That person's praise is not from people, but from God. So this Jewishness is not just an outward appearance, okay? But it must be inward, which is related to the circumcision of the heart through faith or by faith. So a true Jew is one who trusts God and believes in Jesus. And there's a lot of people, you know, not just now, but even in that time, that they were Jewish, they were Jewish ethnically, right? Which has its place before God, but unfortunately they were not Jewish spiritually before God, right? They didn't have or they didn't believe um, upon Jesus Christ. And you needed to have both those things to be considered a true Jew or um, one of God's elect, right? Or one of God's uh, chosen people, rather. So these individuals claiming to be God's chosen people, uh, 
John tells us, what the Lord through John tells us, were actually from the synagogue of Satan with their blasphemous behavior, okay? They didn't have a relationship with Jesus and they opposed those that had a relationship with Jesus Christ. So that's what we see happening here. So once again, the beauty of this is that the Lord knows, right? He says, I know, I know what you're going through. I know what you're facing and I can relate, right? The Lord can relate. Remember what he told his disciples in John chapter 15, right? If you look in John chapter 15, if you look there beginning in the 18th verse, he says, if the world hates you, understand that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. However, because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of it, the world hates you. Remember the word I spoke to you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. But they will do all these things to, to you on account of my name, because they don't know the one who sent me. And what a beautiful thing to serve a savior that can identify with us, right? Because he came in the flesh in the form of a man. And that's a beautiful thing because he knows exactly what we're going through. Sometimes we think to ourselves that we're like the only people going through what we're going through. But there's many, many saints before us that have overcome the same things that we're going through. And the Lord can relate to us as well. So we're in good company, right? When we're suffering. Um, and the beautiful thing is, you can share that comfort that the Lord's given to you in that circumstance to somebody else who's going through a similar thing. And the Lord will give you those opportunities. It's a really beautiful um, cycle that we see the Lord using in our lives. Now, aside from the Lord knowing all these awful things that were happening to the faithful there in Smyrna, he also is well aware of the fact that they were rich, right? He says that these are, they were rich is what he says here. And you know, despite the fact that the people in Smyrna, they didn't have the approval of the people there necessarily, they certainly had the approval of the Lord. And when you think about Smyrna, the, the believers there, outwardly, um, their appearance looked to be one of persecution and one of poverty, okay? But the truth is they were rich spiritually because they were enduring these difficult things um, for the Lord's sake, and when you compare this church to the last letter we read, which was the church of Ephesus, um, the Lord had absolutely nothing against this church. And in fact, this is the only church of the seven that we're going to read through over the next several, um, not, not several weeks, but over the next several months um, that we will see is the only church that the Lord has nothing against. And when you think about that, certainly in the midst of affliction, in the midst of difficulties, that's when we tend to be closest to the Lord, right? Like we cling on to him. And um, that's when the Lord can have or, or do the most impactful work in our lives. And um, when you think about it, maybe it's because of this difficult season that, you know, he didn't have much to say against them because they were clinging on to him. They were abiding in him. They were with him. They were, they were um, holding on to the Lord. Um, so, you know, it's a beautiful thing when we have those opportunities to grow by clinging on to the Lord, abiding in the Lord, even though it's a difficult time, right? And it's easier said than done. Um, I totally, I totally get that because we go through many, many difficult seasons as believers. Now, if you look at verse 10, now the Lord is going to give the church there in Smyrna some specific um, instructions, okay? So not only does the Lord know what's going on, but he also has some practical advice for them. And I love this because the Lord never leaves us hanging, right? Like man does. Like the Lord knows what's going on in our lives, but he's going to also help us get through that situation in our lives, right? He has some practical advice for us, right? Through his word, through the spirit, right? Um, he will always have a solution for us. He tells the church there in verse 10, he says, don't be afraid for what you are about to suffer. He says, look, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison to test you, and you will experience affliction for 10 days. He says, be faithful to the point of death, and I will give you the crown of life. So notice here that the Lord gives them some, some words of encouragement, right? He tells them, you know, don't be afraid. 
Don't be scared. Don't be afraid of those things that you will soon suffer. And remember what he told his disciples, for example, in the Gospel of Matthew. If you look in Matthew chapter 10, verse 28, he tells them, he says, Don't fear those who kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. He says, Rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. So some of these people were going to be thrown into prison. They were going to be tested, right, with tribulation. It says here, for 10 days. And when you think about this, when people were thrown into prison in those times and in those places, it wasn't for rehabilitation. It was for the purposes of awaiting trial and ultimately being executed. So this was not a good thing at all for those individuals that were going to be thrown into prison. Now, when you study that particular verse, it's interesting because there's some debate among scholars whether it's actually 10 days, like it literally means 10 days, or some scholars take a prophetic approach and believe maybe each day is a year and it's 10 years of persecution and tribulation. Um, Some scholars believe it's a duration of 10 emperors, Roman emperors, um, that they would experience this difficulty. Um, I don't know. All I know is that it says 10 days. So in my pea-sized brain mind, um, I think it's a very short period of time. But of course, when you go through some difficult situations, a day could seem like forever, right? So what we know is that they're going to face some difficulties, okay? Um, However long that is, whether it's 10 days or 10 years or the the reign of 10 emperors, we don't know um, specifically. But what we can conclude once again is they're going to face some difficulties, And you may be asking yourself, well, why is the Lord allowing the testing from Satan to take place here? Well, one one thing that comes to my mind is what we read, for example, in the epistle of James. Okay, and we know that from James that when our faith is tested, it produces patience and it produces endurance. Right. So when you think about it, those are the things that make us look more like Jesus. And I think sometimes as believers, we like to think like, um, we like to think about what's like somebody once called kindergarten theology, where you think that you're good. So God's going to reward you. And then when you're bad and then God's going to punish you. Right. But we can't think like that because um, the Lord does whatever he desires to do with us um, to make us better. Okay. So you can be walking with the Lord and have difficulties in your life. Maybe he's doing that because that's the only way he can have a hold of you, right? Um, So don't ever think like a kindergartner, right? Because I am bad, God's punishing me. Or because I am good, God's going to reward me, right? We can't can't live like that. Um, Kindergarten theology doesn't work. Now, the Lord knew Satan's plans in all of this. And the Lord was still in complete control of the situation. Kind of like he was with Job, right? Like he had to ask permission of the Lord to touch Job's life. So sometimes we think that the Lord is not in control anymore. Like it's all chaotic and messed up, but the Lord knows what he's doing. He's in control of our lives. um, And we just need to abide in him and trust him. Now, interestingly, like I said before, this was the only church of the seven that had no evil that was spoken against them, right? Um, There was nothing that the Lord had against the church here in, um, in Smyrna. Now, in thinking about the situation, this particular situation, that this church was facing. It reminded me of um, what we were talking about in the youth group last week. So as you guys know, in our youth group, we're going through the book of Acts. And and last week we were in the 12th chapter. And if you remember in Acts chapter 12, that was a time when James was martyred. That was a time when Peter was thrown into into prison as a result of King Herod's uh, ruthless behavior and his persecution of the early church. And his behavior was um, pleasing to the Jews, but it wasn't pleasing to the Lord at all. And if you remember, when he threw Peter into prison, he ordered four squads of four soldiers to guard him with the intent of bringing him out after the Passover uh, to the people there. It was a very unfortunate situation. But the word of God tells us in Acts chapter 12, verse 5, it says there, so Peter was kept in prison But the church was praying fervently to God for him. And I was telling the young people, I said, this is a very powerful thing. You know, I told them that prayer is one of those powerful tools that we often don't understand how powerful it is because we don't engage in it 
as much as we should. But what we see here in Acts chapter 12 is, of course, the Lord heard these beautiful, sweet-smelling aromas from these people as they prayed fervently for Peter. And then what ended up happening? Well, the Lord sends an angel, right? An angel of the Lord goes to rescue Peter in the middle of the night. And if you remember, Peter was chained between two guards. And what seemed impossible quickly became possible uh, through the Lord. And what we can learn from that is that we need to be praying fervently for our brothers and our sisters that are in the mission fields, our brothers and our sisters in the Lord that are in parts of the world. Think about China, think about North Korea, the parts of the world where Christianity is not very well received and they're being killed daily for their faith, but they're there. They're doing the Lord's work. And, you know, someone once said that when the Christian, when a Christian is persecuted, the only remedy is prayer. And, And that's such a true thing. You know, if God is for us, then who can be against us? And we need to be in prayer for our brothers and sisters um, in the Lord who are in the midst of persecution, in the midst of difficulties, um, because the Lord can do things that seem impossible, right? As we kind of, we've seen throughout the word of God and this example here, for example, in Acts chapter 12. But then he continues and he tells them, he says, be faithful to the point of death. And I will give you the crown of life. So the Lord's encouraging them to be willing to die rather than to renounce their faith for the Lord or in the Lord. And if they did this, he says they would receive the crown of life. And if you remember, we talked a little bit about this the last time um, I was up here. Um, We talked about something called the judgment seat of Christ or the Bema seat of Christ. They're in the book of Romans uh, chapter 15 where the believer will be judged for their service unto the Lord, and they will receive rewards beyond salvation for their service unto the Lord, right? And we talked about the imperishable crown, the crown of rejoicing, the crown of righteousness, the crown of glory, and then the crown of life, which is mentioned here. And it's also mentioned in the epistle of James, if you look in the first chapter, and um, it's in verse 12. But the crown of life is rewarded to those who love the Lord, and they faithfully endure trials, okay? So this is an encouraging thing that the Lord is bringing forth to these believers here in Smyrna, right? To hold fast, and if they do, they will receive this crown um, of life. Just a great encouragement. Um, They're going through this difficult persecution, but if they hold fast, um, they will make it and be rewarded for their love and their faithfulness uh, to the Lord. And he'll do the same for us as well. Now, as we move into verse 11, um, the Lord then, he delivers an exhortation and um, a promise of a reward to the believers there. It says there in verse 11, it says, Let anyone who has ears to hear listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who conquers will never be harmed by the second death. Now, sometimes you hear people say, like, you know, Christians in this country oh, we're being persecuted right now, right? And, you know, you you think about the laws that are being passed. You think about the state of this country. You think about the state of our own hearts. Well, the truth of the matter is, if you compare Christians in the United States to people like in Smyrna, to people that are like in China, in Iran, in Iraq, in North Korea, we are nowhere anywhere facing any type of persecution. We have it pretty easy right now. Now, does that mean we're not going to have persecution in the future, the way things are going Perhaps we will, right, face some difficult times in the future. But right now, I don't think we are being persecuted, right? Um, But despite not facing persecution per se as believers, um, the Lord has something for us through this letter, right? And he says if we're willing to hear, right, if we have ears and we're willing to hear what the Spirit has to say, he certainly will teach us something. And I think for me personally, this has given me more of a, Um, a conscious state of mind where I'm thinking about those that are in the missions field even more so and praying for those that are really facing persecution, that are dying for the faith. And and maybe the Lord's put it on your heart to go into the mission fields, to go to, you know, different parts of the world to to share the gospel for for the Lord's sake. And you're willing to die for the Lord's sake. You're willing to go into those areas of great danger and evilness and darkness. Let this letter be an encouragement to you. Um, because 
once again, if the Lord is for you, who can be against you, right? We can't fear those people that are going to kill us physically because they can't kill us spiritually, right? Because the Lord, the Lord has us. We're in his hands. And this should be an encouragement to us uh, this morning. And the Lord's calling you to go to the ends of the earth, right? To preach the gospel as he's called all of us to do, right? Of course, we're all going to do it in different ways. But maybe he's calling you to go somewhere. Um, be encouraged. Now, the Lord through John then closes with the following promise, right? He closes this letter. He says, the one who conquers will never be harmed, he says, by the second death. Now, the one who overcomes the threat of persecution, the one who um, overcomes the presence of persecution and doesn't renounce their faith will be rewarded, okay, is what's being said here. And, you know, when I think about the best example of somebody overcoming, the greatest overcomer, that would have to be Jesus, right? Um, John 16, 33, this is the Lord. It says, these things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And we can overcome these things as well um, in the Lord. So those that are overcomers will be rewarded, right? And, and he says here that they will be rewarded with the exemption from the second death. So what is the second death that is being spoken of here? Well, think about the great white throne judgment that is spoken of in the book of Revelation chapter 20. Okay, the second death is the lake of fire that is um, recorded for us in verse 14 of Revelation 20. There it says, death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. This is also the place of eternal torment for the devil, the beast, and the false prophet. Revelation 20, 10 tells us the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. And this is also the place where unfortunately all unbelievers will also um, end up. Revelation 20, 15 tells us, and anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. And that's the second death. One scholar puts it this way. The second death was a Jewish expression for the total extinction of the utterly wicked. But praise the Lord that in Christ Jesus, we will never face the lake of fire. And um, that should be an encouragement to us this morning, but also to the believers in that time that were facing, the, from, face, facing some difficulties, some awful things. So everything happening now is temporary, right? And that should encourage us to endure the difficulties that we're facing, right? And be faithful to the Lord and be faithful to the faith, right? And endure, be overcomers, just like he's telling the people here in Smyrna. Now, in closing this morning, we read this beautiful letter of encouragement to a suffering church there in Smyrna. And though they were suffering at the hand of the government and this large Jewish population, that bitterly opposed Christianity, the Lord was with them and he knew all about their suffering. He could identify with their suffering. Then he encourages them, right? By reminding them that he is the first, the last, and he was resurrected from the dead. And he tells them not to be afraid and not to fear the temporary difficulties that would come their way. He tells them to remain faithful to the point of death, right? He says, do not renounce your faith in the face of persecution is what he tells them. And he tells them to remain steadfast. If they do this, they would be rewarded the crown of life given to those who love the Lord and endure trials. And then lastly, he reminds them that if they are conquerors, right, they persevere this persecution, they will never see the second death or the lake of fire, which is reserved for the devil himself and all those that are not saved, the utterly wicked. And these are just some beautiful reminders and promises that the Lord has, not just for them, but for all of us and for all that will ever believe in the Lord. Now, reflecting on this letter, we know as believers that whatever we're facing this morning, and maybe it's not necessarily persecution, but maybe you're suffering this morning. Maybe you're, you, you need a job. Maybe you, you need a physical healing in your body. Maybe you need encouragement. Maybe you need hope, whatever it is. 
The Lord knows what we're going through and the Lord is with us. He never leaves us. And like I said earlier, sometimes we think the Lord is over here and like we're here on the earth and the Lord's oblivious. He doesn't know what's going on in our lives. But the truth of the matter is he knows every detail about us, right? Every, the number of hairs on our head, right? As we lose and get new hairs, all those types of things. Like he knows everything about us. It's, he's amazing. It, it makes my mind hurt when I think about it. You know, just the, the power of the Lord. It's, 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 it's amazing. But maybe this morning you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ and the world has brought you great suffering and you need hope. You need a future. You need a loving father. You know, we're going to give you the opportunity in just a little bit here. But I think what we can take away from all this is that as believers, we know that there comes a cost to being a dedicated Christian, right? There's a cost to all of this when you give a life to the Lord. And obviously there's a bigger cost in some parts of the world than in other parts of the world. But when you think about the world we're living in right now, as time goes on, as pressures increase um, and persecution might be around the corner, we need to be ready as believers. And as we persevere in the midst of trials and persecution and difficulties, some might think of us as, oh, those poor Christians, right? But the truth of the matter is, in the sight of the Lord, we're going to be rich, just like these individuals there in Smyrna. Now, I love what Charles Spurgeon once said regarding persecution and difficulties. He once said, you may fear that the Lord has passed you by, but it is not so. He who counts the stars and calls them by their names is in no danger of forgetting his own children. He knows your case as thoroughly as if you were the only creature he ever made or the only saint he ever loved. Approach him and be at peace. And then the Lord tells us in 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 through 14, and I'll close with this. He says, Dear friends, don't be surprised when the fiery ordeal comes among you to test you, as if something unreal, unusual rather, were happening to you. Instead, rejoice as you share in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may also rejoice with great joy when his glory is revealed. If you are ridiculed for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. Amen. So this morning, if you, um, if you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, and, and maybe you are the world has brought suffering upon you. Maybe you're tired. You've lost hope. You, you've hit rock bottom. There's, there's nothing left for you in your mind. I want to give you the opportunity this morning to have hope, to have a future and a loving father because he will never leave you. He will never forsake you. And he knows everything about you. And, um, you know, if that's you this morning, um, I want to invite you to bow your head, close your eyes, and just repeat this prayer after me. Well, Heavenly Father, this morning, I want to declare you as my Lord and Savior. Uh, Jesus Christ, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you were buried. And I believe that you rose from the dead three days later. I also recognize that I am a sinner. Lord, please forgive me of my sins. Come into my life. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and use me for your glory. I ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. If you prayed that this morning, um, we want to thank you so much for doing so. I can assure you that there is a celebration going on in, in heaven on your behalf. You know, in the Gospel of Luke, it tells us that even when one sinner repents, that there's great joy amongst the angels of the Lord. And um, if you have any questions about maybe your next steps, maybe you need a Bible, maybe you need prayer, you need uh, to get connected with a Bible teaching church, please just reach out to us and uh, we will we'll do our best to help you. Um, come visit us. We meet on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. And our, our building is located at the corner of, um, or the intersection of Hondo Pass and um, Gateway South. So um, we pray that you have a blessed week. Thank you so much for taking the time to, to worship the Lord with us this morning. Uh, we love you. We're praying for you. And uh, we hope to see you again soon. So bye for now.